Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spore of the Warning podcast. This is review number 710 with our review of Thor, Love and Thunder. I'm Christopher Schnasey. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spore the Warning podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a theater near you. Um, this week, we're back in theaters, back for another Marvel film. Um, we're talking about Thor, Love and Thunder. Stephen, how have you felt about uh, the, the Thor franchise up until now? So let's see. For one, Thor is canonically the one Marvel franchise that I am not a completist on. I believe I never did watch Thor Dark World. Uh, I caught up with the original Thor in preparation for Ragnarok. Um, I have not been super high on on the Thor franchise. I enjoyed Ragnarok for what it was, but I certainly didn't see it as this kind of grand pinnacle of marvel cinema i found it way more as being marvel burrowing deeper into the parts of the formula that i don't always love which is them trying to be unserious but not fully committing to the joke and turning it into more of this like self-referential isn't it weird that we're taking this seriously type of humor like for me thor ragnarok didn't feel like a complete movie and i think i was kind of the curmudgeon of the three of us when we recorded it though i don't I'm sure I didn't go hard to the paint. I'm sure I was still like <laughs> rental or caveat or something, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I've never been all that into it. To me, the character of Thor and the premise of the Thor franchise is kind of what generally has made me feel fatigue about Marvel in a single storyline, which is it's an overpowered hero with stakes that are not clear. It cannot possibly take itself seriously, but then also it has to take itself seriously to justify my investment. And I just, in general, it is a hero that I like him as a supporting character in Avengers and other things. I I was a fan of Fat Thor, you know, no disrespect, but (laughs) I haven't vibed that hard with the Thor franchise overall. Yeah, I think Thor is a character that I've never really known much about prior to, you know, all of these films. Uh, But I think like from the start... Um, you know, having an overpowered, uh, super God character is, you know, it is what it is. That's not the most exciting thing. But I think one of the things I enjoyed about the first Thor film was that it, it like truly felt standalone and isolated to the point where it's like Thor just like, you know, basically lands in this little town in the middle of nowhere. And like all the things that happened kind of happen in that space, uh, which was kind of nice. Obviously Thor, the dark world, uh, was a little bit, you know, it was th- that one definitely felt like it was feeding back into stuff. You know, it spent a lot of time talking about the, you know, whatever stone, the, the red mist that turned out to be one of the stones. This is, this is, how, this is like 20 years ago at this point. Um, and it was whatever. But I think that like once Thor became sort of this, not a joke character, but became a comedic character, it kind of brought like a level of excitement back. And now... Now I kind of think of Thor as sort of the the reprieve from the rest of the MCU, right? It is it is the when I sit down to a Thor film, I'm kind of just there to have fun and I care less about what is going on more broadly in the other films and I kind of have reached a point where like the character is now fun to me, you know, like he's been an enjoyable part of multiple films and not just Thor Ragnarok, but once he became that sort of goofball that was able to just play with what the character is instead of being a self-serious character, I think that kind of helped me um, enjoy Thor a little bit, a little bit more. And I think that walking into this film, I was kind of excited to, to be able to experience that once again, because, you know, where we last left <laughs> left off with Thor, um, you know, I, I was enjoying that version of him, sad, emo, fat Thor, was like really, yeah. really fun. And, and, and I was kind of ready. To, I mean, obviously I knew that like he wasn't going to be that exactly now, but the part of that mindset was going to be still with the character. So I was kind of excited going into this, but I was also kind of like, oh yeah, Thor comes out this weekend. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I will say that through all of it, but especially starting with Ragnarok and then into the Avengers bleed in, um, Chris Hemsworth has been a great, comic actor and action actor at the same time i feel like he nails that in a way that is pretty unique like among big blockbusters he really knows how to be self-deprecating not in the like suave downey jr way but in the like i am confident enough in myself that i can make a ton of fun of myself Uh, and i think he is very successful in the franchise overall 
Yeah, I, I just mean, can't I mean, for the life of me tell you what the narrative of the franchise is if I just focus on Thor. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's like Thor, he has a hammer, he's worried he's not worthy, or he wasn't worthy, and then he becomes worthy, and then he becomes not worthy again, and then has to get another hammer because the other one was destroyed, and blah, blah, blah. Something like that. <laughs> I think the arc is always him trying to get back to his Asgardian powers. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, are you ready to do this, Steven? I'm ready. All right. Well, let's, uh, you know, call out to our hammers and build a rainbow bridge uh, across the Bifrost and something, something, something right into this trailer and then come back and give folks a review. <laughs> Kids, get to popcorn now. Let me tell you the story of the space Viking, Thor Odinson. He was no ordinary man. He was a god. After saving planet Earth for the 500th time, Thor set off on a new journey. Well, he got in shape. He went from dad bod to god bod. And after all that, he reclaimed his title as the one and only Thor. Oh, spoke too soon. Jane? The old ex-girlfriend. What's it been like? Three, four years? <laughs> Eight years, seven months, and six days. Give or take. Am I uh, sensing feelings? <laughs> well, you're right. The only ones who gods care about is themselves. So this is my vow. All gods will die. I just want to say that was very, very impressive what you did back there. It's just my first bad guy. You never forget your first. You are not like the other gods of kill. You have something worth fighting for. See who you are and take off your disguise and flick. Oh, you flick too hard, damn it! Shall we help him? And eventually, grape. All right, so that was the trailer for Thor Love and Thunder. Um, basically, when we last saw Thor, he was off gallivanting around the uh, galaxy with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And in this story, he uh, receives sort of a distress signal of sorts um, from someone that he knows and uh, goes to investigate and finds out that there is this uh, being person uh, known as Gore the God Butcher who has uh, decided to take it upon themselves to just kill gods all around the universe um and thor has to team up with uh some other you know thunder powered uh <laughs> friends from his past to uh try to take on the god butcher so stephen miller what did you think of thor love and thunder so first of all i just have to say movies are potentially tainted by your viewing experience and i did not have a wonderful viewing experience uh, this was a <laughs> packed screening christopher and i were both at uh, at the alamo on a thursday night 100 percent occupancy including the seats that are never occupied uh, next to the ones that i booked where they kind of bring in temporary seats to fill the space that a uh, a wheelchair would normally go um i sat in a seat had a person seated, I'm going to say directly in front and to the side of me. I was watching them eat a hamburger for half of the movie. And I was very uncomfortable. I had been reading about BA5 like all day. <laughs> and um, I, I was a little distracted. So I'm going to put those cards on the table. I was a little distracted, a little not happy with how the screening turned out. Um, and so that could have clouded my view of this movie. My view of this movie is very conflicted. I think this is kind of the one of the most weightless, didn't need to exist MCU movies I've seen in a while in that it doesn't really further any kind of plot in a major way. And it feels like it isn't taking itself seriously. 
I think the tone is very inconsistent. Um, I think this has a number of big set pieces, including kind of the final battle that are among the most forgettable things I've seen in a long time in the Marvel Universe. And I think, you know, you talked about Thor being a reprieve. That might have been true when Ragnarok came out, if we pretend Guardians didn't exist. Um, but now, what are the last three Marvel movies we've gotten? We had the last two Marvel movies, I guess. We had Spider-Man No Way Home, <laughs> um, which was weighty, but it wasn't moving the Marvel universe, right? That was, that was a very, like, a side quest yeah. sort of well, movie. We, we thought um, it was going to be moving the Marvel universe, but it turns out... Yeah, we out thought it was. Nothing matters. <laughs> exactly. Nothing mattered in that. We got Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which, again, we were kind of told it was going to be moving the universe, but it turns out nothing mattered in that movie. And now we have another movie where nothing matters. So I think, like, when this movie opened, I would say the first third is extremely jokey and inconsistent in a way that like did not land for me even a little bit. I was kind of sitting there like, okay, I'm glad this movie's only two hours long because I'm not getting much from from this at all. Um, but it's very inconsistent because it also has some of my favorite things in the MCU to date, like hidden in this movie. Um, I think uh, Christian Bale's gore is one of the best villains Marvel has had in terms of having have him have like genuine weight and terror while also being very comic booky. I, I think he is very interesting to watch throughout the movie, and I liked him quite a bit. Um, there is a shadow planet where a battle takes place on that was so cool in the way the lighting was designed and the ramifications of the physics that they've invented for it. Uh, it felt closer to a comic book than anything since 300 for me, just in terms of the, the look and feel really felt like it was steering into like, we are a graphic novel. Like we are inventing a semi cartoon world and we're going to stick to it. And it is going to be cool. Even as it is also abstract. Uh, you know, I, I just thought they nailed that. It, it is one of my favorite sequences that I've seen in a while in an MCU film. Um, there was also a big humor, humorous middle section. I don't think, I don't, for me, the person playing Zeus was not revealed before I watched the movie, so I'm not going to mention it at all. Um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely in, like, as many trailers as I can think of, but... but okay, can, okay. Yeah. Well, if it's in trailers, then I'll just say it. Uh, Russell Crowe playing Zeus in this movie. Uh, it is very long, drawn-out joke, and I loved it. I thought it was so funny <laughs> when, whenever he was talking. They decided to take this tactic with Zeus where he is just, like, a dirtbag greek uncle who is just like sleazy and he's an asshole and he's pompous and he's embarrassing and i i i thought that was great i found it very funny in a way that the similar like gold bloom section in ragnarok i didn't really feel like it fit with the universe even though i liked it here i I thought it had actual bite, too, because the narrative of the movie is gore the god butcher believes that the gods d shouldn't exist and in the middle of this movie, we have a large extended comic moment that is about the Greek gods and how if you look at their actual stories and how they behaved in mythology, they were pieces of shit and you would have hated them. Yeah. And I like I thought it was funny and it fit with the tone of the movie so well and it like actually furthered the theme that they were going for. Um, I, I really liked it. And I also think the cast are pretty good in this movie. I think Chris Hemsworth continues to be great. Always love Tessa Thompson. Natalie Portman, we'll get into it. I, I think she does well, but I think they don't know which lane her character should be in in this movie, and I think that's a problem for it. Um, and Christian Bale is great. So it has some really good stuff, but then overall it just felt inconsistent and weightless, and when my favorite things weren't happening, it was like one of the most boring tooth pull MCU movies for me. I just <laughs> I found very little to like in the filler. I thought a lot of the action was stupid and uninteresting that the plot is so mcguffin -y that like you don't even remember while you're watching it what they are supposed to be doing next um i it was a real mixed bag for me uh but overall pieces i really liked pieces i really didn't like a recurring joke about weapons that i thought was actually very funny <laughs> okay <laughs> that I, is thought, my review. I thought for a second you were gonna talk poorly about the weapons joke and no, I was that is be the very best upset. recurring joke in the movie for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah that is that is probably it, that I think that fed half of my enjoyment of this film, mm. um, especially given the context of like 
him having an X back in the picture, but also having an X weapon back in the picture. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it was just, you know, chef's kiss. Perfect. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of negative uh, commentary around this film, and I don't know if it's just because of my like, you know, expectation setting going into it or just the fact that I'm just like there to hang out and enjoy my time. Like, I, I think I did for the most part, enjoy my time during this, uh, this ride. I think that, yes, the story is a mess, but there are a lot of good ideas here that are pretty interesting. Like you talked about Christian Bale being one of the best villains in the MCU. And I, I think that's true. Like he's of all the people he has the most, like, sure. Thanos, you know, we get it. Like, you know, existentially, it makes sense. If half of the universe was gone, then the resources wouldn't be as crazy. And like, you know, I, I get the principle of it, but I feel like when we're introduced to him, he already has that plan and we don't see the origin of it really. Um, we just kind of like hear about what the motivation is behind this. We see in the like basically cold open for this film, we see an entire journey that Christian Bale's character goes on to become who he is. And we see it's not a person who like had power and then that power like made him go crazy and do something different. It's like literally he goes through a thing. He wants to rely on the gods. He learns that the gods are not there to be helpful and is then granted power that allows him to deal with that fact. And he just makes an oath to just go around to slaughtering gods. And I think that that simple premise was really compelling and interesting. And I immediately got what the character was about and uh, was kind of excited to see what he was doing. And even the jumping around to see uh, the aftermath of what he does in different places, he seemed like a scary, formidable villain who uh, I was excited to see our heroes go up against. Um, and somebody like, I don't want to say that I could get behind, but it's like I understood the motivations behind who they were as a character. Yeah, I would say his methods are suspect, but he is not really proven wrong in the movie <laughs> um, in his <laughs> aims. Yeah, like you, you rarely find gods in this film that uh, deserve to live <laughs> or, yeah. or at the very least are helpful to anybody other than themselves. Um, so so that was really awesome. But I think that even that itself is sort of like it's sort of backstory. It, honestly, this film and that character feel like the same arc that Thanos took, but like over many, many films, it's like, we're watching these characters go around and have fun. And we were hearing about this person who was going around doing this stuff and that will become a villain later. And it's kind of like right towards the end, then it becomes like, okay, here he is. Let's go fight him. Um, so, so I think that like, you know, I would almost, it, I would almost have rather seen a fully serious film about taking on Gore, the God Busher. Um, but I also am happy to have seen the comedic film about Thor and uh, Jane and, you know, hit the hammers and like all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's kind of like this mix of two films that would have been better apart being slammed together into one in a way that was still enjoyable as I watched both parts. But I felt like I was ping ponging back and forth between them and trying to find a happy medium, um, which isn't always something uh, that I was able to get. Uh, yeah, I, I think in general, what this film does is kind of make me question what gods do in the universe of the MCU. Like, I, I understood, like, I've always understood that Thor was a god, but that didn't mean anything to me. So the fact that somebody would be going around trying to kill them seems strange because outside of like living in Asgard and having Asgardian gods, like helping to protect you. I had no understanding of what other gods do to their peoples other than, you know, the guy with the sun headdress thing <laughs> that we yeah. see at the very, very beginning of the film. I didn't understand what that relationship was of people to gods and what the expectation was out of them. So it's kind of like, I totally get the, the bad guys motivations, but I don't understand the world's connection to the gods. Um, let's see. One thing I really disliked about this film is, uh, I, I guess I'm tired of in the MCU in every single film, there just seem or film series. There just seems to be one thing that does whatever you need it to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like Thor was trying to get the gauntlet and the infinity stones and was like, once I have this, I can basically make a wish and, <laughs> and do whatever I want. Um, 
this film has a very similar thing. I'm already forgetting. There's another film. What shit? Uh, Doctor Strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in Doctor Strange, yeah, that's what, in Doctor Strange, there's like a book that gives you whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like in every franchise or every every like part of the series, it just turns like there's just. There's an object that'll give somebody whatever they want. We got to get to it first, and then we'll call it a day, um, which just seems strange. Like I kind of, I, I like, I feel like this villain had enough going on that he didn't need to get to eternity, right? He, he could have just yeah. been who he was and just go around killing all the gods. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, that that's the one thing that I don't quite understand why we needed to go to this level of like let's endanger all the things and have like a magic. Uh, ability that suddenly can just take out everyone in the universe and call it a day um so yeah but besides that i i enjoyed it i I loved i loved the dynamics i i love like all the flashbacks to story we never got to see of of thor and jane in their like normal lives and just being together i love the everything they were playing with with the weapons and the personalities of the weapons um i actually really like the inventiveness of what they do with mjolnir uh and how a hammer that was once broken and shattered into a million pieces could be used in fights yep. now that it's put back together that was very very inventive so i think there's lots of fun stuff in here um and like i i you know i walked away going like yeah i had fun what more can i want from a thor film <laughs> yeah i oh like i don't mean to be a crank cuz i don't all those things were fine. They they just didn't add up to be like I felt like I was just had a movie playing in front of me. I didn't feel like I was in an adventure while I was watching it at all. Like like there was just something about like like you know you, you mentioned the uh, the the looks back in the past, like the flashbacks to seeing uh, Thor and Jane's relationship. Uh, I liked that in principle like i like the idea of it but there was a way where it was like it was utilized in a story that introduces some heavy realities for some of the characters and also has a whole ton of goofiness and is narrated by taika waititi and there was something about that combination that made any of that stuff that attempted to make it be a part of a universe we have already seen before feel odd to me like this feels like a side quest where the character is like it is the person that Thor was based on, not Thor. <laughs> like, like it, it feels to me so separate. It is almost more of the light year thing than it is a continuation of this Marvel conversation. And I think that's just the YTT style. Like he just, uh, he heightens the absurdity of some comedy in a way where you just can't imagine it coexisting with the rest of it. And that meant when it says like, remember your relationship with, you know, Natalie Portman, I'm like, yeah, but that was, those were the characters that they played. Those those weren't these people, you know. <laughs> like it just, it didn't totally work for me. And i I like I like the design of how they use the hammer. I I think that is cool. I liked it. It's just um, Thor fights like Doctor Strange and like um, Captain Marvel and probably others that I'm forgetting. I don't know the rules at all about what you can and can't do and how much power it is and how what is a big hit and what is not a big hit and there's something about it that makes most of the fighting just not resonate for me in this series at all Um, steven Steven, it's really it's really easy if you hold the hammer up and lightning hits it big hit if you just swing it small hit (laughs) right there there's um like a lot of people, I, I've listened to some reviews of this movie uh, because we watched it on a Thursday and whatever. It's been a, a full weekend in between. Um, <laughs> a lot of people have been very praiseworthy of the like final third of this movie. Like there, there's a final confrontation and then a little wistful closing that happens there. Um, and for me, none of that worked at all. For me, that was like so fluffy and weightless and CG spectacle. And I I couldn't even feel that action was happening. Like it, it just felt, it felt like the tone of we're having fun and telling a kid's story was so heightened by then that I wasn't actually 
engaged in any action and all of that fell totally flat for me for some reason like the the middle the shadow planet loved it big big fan everything that happened after the shadow planet i was like okay when is this thing wrapping up because clearly the plot isn't going to move <laughs> anyway and it, it's funny because we can talk in spoilers like the plot does move to major places hypothetically but i just don't believe any of it so it doesn't mean anything for me yeah um and we can talk about what that means so, so one thing I do want to mention is like you talked about this feeling like a side quest and it's like that is the li literal narrative construction of this film, right? Like he is with the Guardians and he literally leaves them <laughs> to go on his own side quest. And that is what we're watching. And, and like I have my own complaints about that, like just that it feels like this film is like a total complete retcon of where mm -hmm. where that character was going. Like it's like that film ends with him taking off with them and it's like, OK, We'll throw the guardians in for five minutes at the beginning, and then he's going to go off and do his own thing. And it's like, well, why? Why did you even have them? It's like every every Thor film ends with him being picked up by the guardians and then leaving right. to go do his own thing after that. And it's like, sure, if you're just trying to like go back to that well as a joke, that's fine. But it seems kind of strange, like set up one thing and then immediately abandon that to go do your own thing. Yeah, um, I think that was something I couldn't remember because the. F the first like 10 minutes of this movie plays a lot on the idea that Thor has a relationship with the guardians and now they're bouncing off of it. Like some of it's even in the trailer, right? Him saying goodbye and everything. Have we had any Marvel movie where he spends a lot of time with them? Or is that just the promise at the end of guardians Two or end of end game? So I, I think when I forget exactly how it works, but I think when, uh, when the, the, when Asgard is destroyed, uh i think he ends up just floating through space and he l gets picked up by the guardians and that's how he returns to the rest of the group like he literally like mm -hmm. slams into their front windshield on their ship um and then is brought on board um but at the end of whichever the film it is he sort of gives up his post with the rest of the asgardians who were rescued from the destruction of asgard um he sort of hands that over to valkyrie and is like hey you're king now you stay here i need to go find myself and i'm gonna go out with the guardians and go enjoy myself there and then so it's like we so he he literally decided to go off on adventures with them and then we pick up in this film with him being like yeah i gotta sort of gotta go off and find my own thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like it's odd like it, it makes it feel like volume three was meant to come out before this movie or something <laughs> yeah which you know who knows but but yeah i think the, the other thing i was going to say though where, where i was going is that i think that not only is it set up as a side quest but i think that the narration by taika is it feels quite literally like he is telling the story which yeah. It can be heightened because it's his sort of fictional telling of these events that took place. It's like he is sort of narrating, narrating it to a bunch of kids that sort of think Thor is super awesome. And he's like, let yeah. me tell you the story about our, our friend Thor. Right. So, so it's kind of like I'm I'm watching it like not not to go back to our our, our recent trend of like, but Stephen, it's like a kid's story. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um but like there's there, there's something where it's like because the narrative framing is that and because it's so silly i kind of just take it at its silliness and i don't worry about it trying to be like a real serious thing at all yeah yeah i buy that speaking of kids there's clearly a heavy theme in this movie about children and taking care of children and um i don't know if you have seen the cast at all in this movie of who plays some of those children but it, there's definitely a little bit of meta element going on uh we, we will get to why that is meta maybe if we do a spoiler section um but i will say not only do christian bale natalie portman and taika waititi's kids all show up as new asgard children in this movie which very much fits with the vibe of how the movie seems to be telling a story yeah. um but Chris Hemsworth's daughter, his daughter is in this movie in uh, a very interesting role that might have ramifications for future uh, <laughs> future things. And that I thought that was cute. Interesting. I did not look up any of that casting information, but uh, I have a feeling I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you're you're going to love the uh, the choice they made there. Yeah. 
Can we talk, we'll have to talk around it a little bit, but I feel like the introduction of Jane as Mighty Thor was very oddly handled. And I don't know what I want because them directly doing the thing that every other superhero movie would have done would have probably felt very rote to me and not interesting. But the way they did it instead made it feel like they just cut out part of the movie or cut out key parts of her character. That It was something very strange to me because if the point of view is this magnificent story that uh, rock monster Taika is telling his little tykes um, in the future... It would the perspective wouldn't be anchored only on uh, Thor. Like they wouldn't only be in Chris Hemsworth's point of view. So we would actually be able to see more of Jane's story, and we don't really get a lot of her story. We only get little snippets, and that just tonally, by the time Thor and Jane meet for the first time in this movie, I just felt like all of the vibes were wrong in terms of the weight of that meeting and what had been setting up for it. And I don't know, there's just something very odd to me about the way they chose to do that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I like the shtick that they have going together in this film. So it didn't bother me too much, but I think what did bother me is there is sort of, there is an explanation provided through flashback as to why she may have been able to interact with something. But there is an explanation given at the end of this film (laughs) Mm -hmm. that seems to counter that (laughs) in a way that I don't understand. And that's definitely a a conversation for spoilers. So it's kind of like, I really, really, really liked the first explanation I I just thought that was fantastic way to to bring those two things together um and provide something that uh Thor would be interested in. <laughs> yeah. Um I think the way it's played at the end, I understand why it's played that way because of the stakes it wants to build and set up and sort of the way it wants to tug at things. But mm-hmm. I I think that later thing feels like it conflicts with with everything, and it, I don't know. I I just didn't like the way it played out later. Um, but I loved I loved the way it was set up. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm okay with that. I think just the I, and again, this will be spoilery too. The, the jokiness of the movie, which again I respect. I don't I don't want all Marvel movies to look and feel exactly the same. But the jokiness of the movie felt like it undercut the importance of them reuniting and also Jane's arc overall, which is dealing with some big things. Um, it, I, I don't know. I don't know what a better formula would have been for that, but something there just felt very kind of dissonant to me. Yeah. Also, uh, <laughs> to, to back you up with, a, with, a, with another prime example that I can hopefully um, talk ambiguously around. Um, uh, Jane has a secret that she's not sharing with folks. Uh, mm-hmm. When we are introduced to her, <laughs> she's, she's sitting next to somebody reading a book she, she wrote, yep. and she calls attention to the fact that she wrote it. There is not a single world in which that, that kid is not immediately on a phone on Twitter, like saying that he just met this person at this place, um, yep. which seems to go in the face of of the secret that she is trying well, to keep. Well, I just don't know if the the one person she's trying to hide this secret from is on Twitter. I, I, I think that's <laughs> what it boils down to. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, but still, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, I took it, I took it in that she doesn't want people anywhere to know. Hmm. Like she wants to, yeah. We'll we'll get into it. <laughs> Uh, also, in, in terms of things we'll get into in spoilers that are probably just infuriating for me to talk around right now, um, you had a big plot furtherance problem with Iron Man 3, with how that movie ended and what it could mean for the franchise going forward and the stakes of Iron Man and the tools at Iron Man's disposal. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think this movie ends with something that begs a similar question. <laughs> um and I will give it a pass for being cutesy, but there was something in me that was like, I don't, I don't know if that's how it works. <laughs> and if that's how it works, I don't know why bad things happen <laughs> ever. 
Oh, well, no, we're we're getting good. And why does he even need a hammer? <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into it. But you have to admit, if you were a kid watching that, you would have lost your shit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> But hey, maybe the answer to that question is exactly why, uh, exactly why Christian Bale is trying to murder all the gods. Mm-hmm. That's true. the 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 one the one, the one thing I will say, and hopefully this isn't too much of a spoiler. Um, there's a point where they go to uh, this place. I forget what it's called. It's like omnipotence or something like that. Um, and it's like a place that all the gods go to hang out and. Uh, there's this joke made of like, oh, hey, there's the God of Carpentry. <laughs> That's definitely a Jesus joke, right? <laughs> yeah, I did, it flew by, so I didn't get to see... They don't show him, right? They just yeah, point. No, they, they don't show him. Like, I... <laughs> like... Yeah, that's a good one. I definitely, I definitely chuckled to myself, but like there wasn't, there was no audible anything from the theater of anybody else like acknowledging that as a joke. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm the only one that thinks Jesus is funny. <laughs> Yeah, can you can you imagine if Gore then killed him and evangelicals watching this movie still were boycotting it because two male rocks held hands or something? <laughs> that would be pretty good. Oh, oh I, I just wanted to say, in, in a world where, like, you know, Lightyear has been getting, like, criticized for, quote, wokeness and all that stuff, I do feel like this movie is also one of the more, like, effortlessly diverse movies in Marvel, like in a bunch of varieties but specifically like there are multiple like non-straight characters in this movie and it is never a big deal and i I don't know i i kind of like that it's one thing where taika's like when taika changes the rules of the story he can also mess with things that marvel execs normally wouldn't be okay with and i respect that like there's a lot that i like about how this movie is made yeah yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it does feel like he's sort of playing in the sandbox where it's like he's getting away with more than he should be allowed to get away with because, like, everything he's saying is completely made up. Mm. <laughs> but, hey, good on him. Like, <laughs> do, so, so do you want to actually have a spoiler section to, to, to try to get into some of these things? I think we should. It doesn't need to be a long one, but we okay. should at least rattle through them. Cool. Uh, well, before that, let's go ahead and give folks a pre-spoiler verdict um, if you were going to give us a must-see, record with a caveat, wait for rental, pass with a caveat, or a must-avoid, what would you give it? I am giving this film a wait for rental. I, it, it is strange to say because it truly does, like that shadow planet fight is one of my favorite action set pieces in the Marvel franchise that I can remember. Um, but the filler in between the things that I like just were everything I don't like about the Marvel formula. And like, I really... I don't think Taika is upending the Marvel formula. I think he is just quadrupling down on it. And whether you like that or not is really kind of dependent on how bought into the universe you are. And with me feeling fatigue, he didn't do anything to remove the fatigue. So I thought this movie was pretty weightless, didn't mean very much. Nothing was very impactful for me. It had scenes that are worth watching, you know, watch it on a plane or something. It's fine. But I would not suggest going to a crowded thursday night screening of this movie uh i didn't personally find it worth the the effort yeah well the good news is by the time this episode comes out i mean all the theaters will be wildly empty and everybody can go see it in peace <laughs> yeah um I, I think for me I'm, I'm gonna give it a recommend with a caveat um i i this isn't like an amazing show-stopping film that like you have to rush out and see but i did enjoy my time with it um and i think that you know, I had fun. Like, I was glad to have sat through it. Um, and, and I, yeah, I, I feel like as long as you don't spend too much time thinking about <laughs> where it falls short of what it could have done, I think it's it's fun enough. And to watch these characters sit and play, like, I feel like everybody in this film is having fun. Like, everybody mm-hmm. knows what kind of movie they're in. They know what they're doing. They're enjoying it. Um, some of the repeated stunt casting uh, of some characters in it, it are super enjoyable, and I think that like they're just uh, it... the the Asgardian actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgot to call them out, but <laughs> made me laugh second time as if I hadn't seen it before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so good, it's so good. I love it. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so I, I had a fun time, and I hope that y'all do too. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for our non-spoiler review of Thor Love and Thunder. Um, we're going to close the episode out uh, and then transition on into spoilers. So for now, in our pre-spoiler goodbye, Stephen Miller, if people want to find you throughout the week, where can they do that? Uh, people can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at ChristopherInRealLife.com or Twitter.com slash ChristopherIRL. You can find the podcast over at TheSpoilerWarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so on Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. Um, if you want to know the episodes go live, you can follow us at Twitter.com slash SpoilerWarning, Facebook.com slash TheSpoilerWarning, or Instagram.com slash TheSpoilerWarning. If you want to get help us directly, you can send an email to the fans, fans at TheSpoilerWarning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site, Music for this episode will come from a track selected from artlist.io, so hopefully you're enjoying that. That music is going to fade up, and when that music fades back out, we'll be in uh, spoiler territory, so watch out. Um, Spoilers are going to come at you like a bunch of uh, flying goats. So... All right, we are back. This is Spoiler Territory. It's the after part of our review of Thor, Love, and Thunder. We are here talking full-blown spoilers, so watch out. Stephen Miller, where do you want to start out? So I guess we can start with the introduction of Jane. Uh, Jane is introduced. We are shown that she has cancer, uh, stage four cancer. She's in a waiting room, uh, you know, waiting to be seen. I, be- I believe she has an IV drip or something in her yeah, and yeah. she's talking to a person sitting next she's, to her. She's like actively um, receiving chemotherapy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 She's receiving chemotherapy. I assume she the doesn't cancer have long to live. came from holding an infinity stone inside of her body in the form Probably. of red mist for a long yeah. time. I, I've been watching a lot of house lately and that definitely seems like a, a thing that would happen. And in fact, season four, episode five, it's kind of what happens to this kid. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> That was um, phase zero. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the MCU phase zero. Um, but but anyway, so from there, she decides to go to New Asgard because she feels um, Milnor. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, calling to her, basically, she feels whispers, and then she approaches the broken apart hammer, which is now in a display case. You know, people treat it as a museum, and the sky starts to get cloudy and it hints that something is happening. The next time we see her, it is as a kind of casual reveal to Chris Hemsworth when he comes back to New Asgard to protect it. And she is just this badass, you know, female Mighty Thor going around fighting people. And it is, it is all very jokey. Like when he sees her, her first lines to him, Tessa Thompson talking about her being back, it, it all feels very much like, oh yeah, of course she's Thor now. And I, there was just, to me, something odd about the whiplash of like, she has cancer, she's dying, we're meant to take that seriously. This big thing that is the hope of her survival happened off screen, and now she is kind of a joke at, Thor's expense like I don't there was something about that that just like I don't know what it was but it didn't feel calibrated correctly to me if it, it felt like it failed at all levels it was trying to do well I I think I think it's part of a strategic bait and switch right like our expectation is that Mjolnir uh, cured her that like she mm-hmm. was able to wield, wield, wield the hammer and now she is restored everything's dope she's living her best life and now it's all about like is she still attracted to thor and blah 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 and it's not until she like goes into the bathroom and like looks at herself in the mirror and like dethorifies then you see that she still is sick and dying and then she like you know rethorifies and like it's it's part of this and even there we don't know if that's inside of herself inside her head thinking back to like what she was before this moment and is she anything without Thor, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it is really there to kind of get you to forget all that, to go like, oh, well, she's clearly she's better now. She's doing flips and throwing her hammer around. Like mm-hmm. she must be totally fine. And then you get that like, you know, sort of pu- or sucker punch of sorts later on when you find out that like, no, she actually is still dying. And then they add the thing that, you know, I was 
teasing in the pr before right. thing where it's like it's like not only is she dying but it turns out the hammer every time she thors up it like is actively undoing the chemotherapy that she's been getting which yeah. i guess would be curing her if she wasn't using the power so then it becomes a thing of her needing to sacrifice to do what needs to be done as opposed to just somebody who is like addicted to it and can't like let it go um, right yeah so i i'm fine with the bait and switch i just think the bait didn't work like i think the <laughs> the switch like when when we find out she still has cancer and she's still dying great i'm i'm into that i i think that is fine and tonally speaking if the previous part had been all positive switching it into being dark and serious again would be completely fine in that but the bait for me like that alone when she meets chris hemsworth for the first time here none of it felt real at all it felt like so much of a joke that she was a cool action hero it felt like it didn't feel like she was a character it felt like she was a plot device for him to make jokes about how awkward it is to be around your ex like like i didn't feel like they did her character justice in her introduction because all we see is what thor sees of her and to me that isn't a bait and then switch because it's sad it's like a you didn't give me enough to root for, so the switch doesn't feel like a big reveal because she was only a throwaway joke for him, like in the last scene. That that was kind of how it felt for me, at least. Yeah, I, I guess I guess to me, I see it less as a throwaway joke and more of a this is what we're going for, right? Like this this is not sorry this this is like the the now they have a chance to be to get like we're watching a rom com basically, right? Like we're yeah. we are watching the. Like, what if your, what if your ex, uh, had the same like exact job as you, but like they were better at it, right? Like, like yeah. that's that's the world we're playing in. It's not it's not just the like isn't Thor like thrown off by the fact that she's Thor now too. Uh, it's more of a like okay now they're like on an even playing field um except for she has the advantage because everybody likes her and she's super dope and he has the she has the old hammer and it's kind of like it's i mean for me i was just always living in the joke territory but for me it didn't feel like at anybody's expense it felt like that was the joke that we were playing into as we watched right i just think in a rom-com you would have more screen time devoted to her too and this doesn't have that so this feels more like a throwaway gag about thor that that's all which yeah, means okay. then later when her death is or like her impending death and then her eventual death is supposed to be like a big heavy thing that ties the movie up. I just felt like, well, but she was a joke. Like, like everything you showed me about her was a joke before this. So I don't, I, I don't know. It, it just didn't work for me. But, but Steven, she finally picked a good catchphrase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think for me, that's the, my biggest disappointment with that whole thing is that i i really really as i teased earlier i really really love the idea of the hammer was protecting her because thor asked it to like mm -hmm. when they were back together he said look after her and keep her safe and then the thor was acting on its own to keep her safe but then when it switches to be that the thor is leeching the life force from her I mean, I guess it makes sense that if, like, a mortal wields the power of the gods, then that's too much for them to handle. But it's like, okay, so if she just hung out with the hammer, would she be fine indefinitely as long as she doesn't start, like, throwing lightning bolts and stuff like that? So it, it was, there was something about the rules that didn't didn't work for me, and it felt like the whole, like, it, it would be one thing if she wasn't a scientist, right, and Thor left her and she wanted to best him to become a better hero than him so she became addicted to using the power of the hammer and that's what was killing her and she never had cancer mm -hmm. like that that would make more sense to where like hey just don't be thor and you'll be fine but she was like unwilling to let go of it and was unintentionally killing herself by wielding it but the fact that she was already dying but the thing that is going to kill her was also saving her. I just, I just didn't understand. Right, that. it means her sacrifice isn't. It's like it's a speeding up, but it isn't a sacrifice. It's sacrificing something, but it isn't sacrificing the stakes that the movie wants it to. Well, they, she already only had a few months yeah, to live. Uh, but they, they, they imply that like. I mean, they, they straight up say it. They don't even imply it. They say that 
something is acting against the chemo. Mm-hmm. And it, it sounds like if she just put down the hammer, she would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is weird. <laughs> it's really, really weird. It, it does bolster Gore's argument that the gods are evil, though. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. even even the hammer that's supposed to trust, like protect you, is just killing you. I think Gore actually whispers that to her. I don't think it's a novel argument. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I, I, like he he says it to her too. Uh, Thor says like, "Hey, this thing is killing you." Um, right, but. But yeah, Gore, Gore yeah. sort of sides with her in, in a way because he understands like they are both mortals who are given the powers of a god. Um, mm. And yeah. Um, let's see. Do we want to start? Do we want to get into the Eternity Wish? And why? Yeah. Why? So first of all, was his daughter already powerful before she was brought back? Um, Great question. No idea. <laughs> and, and, and I don't remember. And second of all, this goes back to like the unsnapping um, that <laughs> happens in the previous mm-hmm. films. Couldn't Christian Bale say, "All right, here's my wish. I wish my daughter was back as a god with the power to give life, and then everyone currently in the lake of eternity can be healed, <laughs> no more cancer. Mm-hmm. Christian Bale's no longer di- dying. The daughter's back. Doesn't he get everything he wants by just bringing his daughter back as a god?" Probably, but I don't know what gods can do in in this universe. I also don't know the rules of wishing. Uh, Robin Williams famously taught us that you can't do any bullshit like wish for more wishes. Like there's certain <laughs> limits to to what you're allowed to do. Um, that, that's just a I wish. do think his wish was very limited. I, I think a, a more creative compound wish could have probably yeah. <laughs> solved a lot of problems. I also didn't realize this thing eternity that everyone knows about all the gods know how to get there they know what the key is and everything it grants one wish to one person and then never again does anything yeah Um, i I don't because another guy is there who would have a wish that would certainly solve a lot of his problems (laughs) (laughs) um yeah i I didn't i didn't understand the ramifications like what's the cooldown on eternity well i guess it's in the name (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe, mm-hmm. yeah maybe nobody else dare use it like none of the gods are going to use it because they don't need a wish because they're gods um mm-hmm. but but yeah also like thor as guardians not the most powerful gods like they obviously don't hang out in the temple of omniscience or whatever um mm-hmm. but wh- why why is the bifrost the key <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I, I don't understand. Um, I have no idea. That whole, the whole fight sequence with Thor and Gore and the kids and everything in that area, it all, the pacing felt odd to me. Like when, when Thor is finally defeating Gore, and then he like rushes to Natalie Portman. And make sure she's okay. Gore just kind of like walks into eternity like lazily behind Thor. Like he just lets him win. It, it It's very weird to me. Yeah. I know the movie wants him to make it, but we don't have a moment where Thor is like, no, it's too late. It's just like, oh, there he is. I guess I'm going to follow him. Well, I like, think it's, it, it was strange. I think it's sort of like, a, remember in uh, Dark Knight? Dark Knight? I think it was a Dark Knight, uh, where where Batman has his friend and his girlfriend <laughs> both tied up in different locations uh, yeah. with bombs, and he has to like decide between the two things. I think that's sort of where Thor is, right? Thor just wants to feel shitty about someone, and uh, in that moment, he doesn't give a shit about Gore, and he feels mm-hmm. shitty towards Jane. <laughs> Yeah, but but I mean that's such a weird choice. Like, if your choice was to temporarily comfort someone who is laying there or save the universe, <laughs> well, he, like he knows in that moment that he's going to be gone anyways. So what does mm-hmm. he care? <laughs> and also, he's not saving the universe; he's just saving the gods. Saving the gods. That's yeah, yeah. true. He's just saving the gods. And he but, already... but still, he could do both, right? Like it would take him like half a second to <laughs> go get Gore. And then go back to Natalie and see how she's doing. Yeah. I don't know. That's the choice I would make. 
but I'm also here sleeping in a different <laughs> building from my wife <laughs> because she might have COVID. <laughs> so, yep. Maybe that says more about me than it does about Thor. <laughs> I'm, I'm not glad, a different building, just a different room. <laughs> I'm glad you added the, the because she might have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just saying for me, choosing between comforting someone and maybe getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> let alone comforting someone versus all gods, including myself, get destroyed. True. I see what I see what you're saying, um, but yeah. Let, let, Who are gods in Asgard? Because I don't remember how the mythology works from the first couple movies. Like Thor and Odin and Loki are gods, yeah. um, or Loki is a demi god, I guess, because he's half like frost giant. Um, <laughs> I I feel like that's accurate, but it just sounds so stupid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is Valkyrie a god? Uh yeah, I mean the well she's like yeah she's are, the are last of the Valkyries. They're are the kids gods? The kids are not gods. They're just as guardians. Okay, so as guardians are just regular people. Yeah, they're the humans. And then of... val- all, but the warriors are all gods. I think so. Okay. Yeah, everyone who wears armor, <laughs> it's a god. I don't know. <laughs> Did we answer the question? Cool. Yeah, I'm good. I got no, I got no more questions. All right, so let's go back to your your Iron Man three comparison. Um, right. So I assume what you're getting at is that Thor can bestow his Thor like powers on anybody who wants. So in yeah, theory, he can just make an army of Thors. <laughs> yeah. So basically, end of end game, he could have just said like, "All right, all of us, <laughs> like, like." All the heroes from everywhere, all the people, all the guardians, all the Wakandans, all the, you know, everyone from everywhere. It's just Thor all of a sudden. And then all the Thors could have just killed Thanos. Exactly. Yeah. I have nothing else to add. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I agree. It sure seems to imply, unless, unless, uh aha, solved it uh gods only have dominion and power over their followers so mm. all well no that's not even true because not everybody was as guardian there's a whole joke about right. like there's like the green kid and like the other kid and they're like but i'm not as guardian it's like well you are today oh um, yeah so so yeah i i got nothing <laughs> yeah i like like i get it i kind of like in principle, the idea that the movie opens with Jane becoming a Thor and then it ends with all the kids becoming a Thor, right? Like it has that wish fulfillment quality to it. But I think it kind of undercuts the the hammer and all of the narrative around protecting Jane and stuff too. Like not not just the idea that we learned that the hammer is draining her life force, but the idea that, oh, by the way, Thor can just make anyone Thor and not drain their life force. Yeah. Um, it just seems kind of odd. Yeah, well technically didn't he put the thor powers into the weapons they were wielding and then the, yes they did get glowy eyes and stuff but i feel yeah, like got glowy eyes. i feel like that was that was like cast off from the weapon right it's like you mm. grab the weapon the weapon has the power but as long as you don't like channel a bunch of lightning through your human body i think you're okay um and they were they they weren't all as guardians but they were definitely all as aliens right yeah <laughs> yeah all I'll allow it. Whatever. <laughs> you gotta admit, though, the friggin' the little girl who like refuses to choose a weapon and chooses a bunny rabbit anyways, and then just like yeah. the bunny rabbit shoots lasers out of its eyes. That was pretty. Yeah, that, that was, was cool. pretty amazing. Very little kid logic, and I want to hope that girl was one of the daughters of the the cast. I I didn't look at who was who. I just saw that all of their kids were in the movie. Yeah. Um. So speaking of kids, and then, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was probably going to make the same segue you did, yeah. uh, that at the end of this movie, uh, so Gore has decided to resurrect his daughter named Love, which I didn't remember that was her name, but apparently it was, um, and he resurrects her just long enough for her to watch him die, and then Thor 
takes her under his tutelage. He he becomes basically a father to her. Uh, and that is Chris Hemsworth's actual daughter, which is cute. Um, makes some nice chemistry. And it makes me believe more than I did before that they might actually have plans to have Thor be teaming up with her in like future installments of things, which would be kind of adorable. Don't really know how the combo works. It kind of feels like a retread of Doctor Strange and America. Um <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of this movie feels a lot like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, honestly. Um, but whatever, it's it's cute. Yeah, I, I do want to know. Outside of the the real life lineage, where does she get her powers from? Because she definitely has like purpley glowy eyes at the end, right? Yeah, and because wasn't Gore the God Butcher supposed to be like he was a man? And he and his daughter worshipped the gods and he lost his daughter. Like there was nothing powerful about her yeah. unless coming back from eternity just like gives you eternal you powers. Get powers for being resurrected. It It is strange. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't quite understand it. And why? Because at the end, Thor isn't wielding Mjolnir, right? Like he gives he gives his daughter or he gives love the the big hammer which is fine. That one doesn't require anything to wield it. Um, but why? Also, if Thor can just speak things and have it be true, why would he not have taken his other hammer, which is so important to so many different plot beats, and also whispered to it and said, only those who are worthy shall be able to wield you, and then make it mm -hmm. so that, like, Gore can't pick up the hammer. Right. Isn't it an axe? Yeah, yeah it's an axe. It's like an axe hammer. hammer. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I don't remember what Thor is wielding at the end of this movie. Didn't he take the lightning bolt, or did he give that back to Valkyrie? I, I honestly, I don't, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I just remember them running and going like ah, and then it's like love and thunder. Yeah, and then we have the little uh, mid credit scene where Hercules is going to go after him now instead, and I guess that's going to happen in the next movie, which is, it is weird for me to think that Russell Crowe's Zeus, like, I really liked him in this movie as a funny like, aside. It is really weird if he is an actual villain in future movies. I feel like he's way too goofy yeah, to yeah. do a real heel turn like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely uh, it's definitely an, an interesting, interesting choice. <laughs> mm. But like in this like secret universe or hidden world or, what, or whatever they're all building towards supposedly in phase four, I just can't, I can't picture Russell Crowe's Zeus being a part of that, uh, that story. It just seems weird. Well, I mean, it sounds like he is just the jumping off point, right? Cause you got, you got friggin' Roy Kent <laughs> as Hercules. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it seems like he is just like, like I want to assume that Zeus is actively dying still, but he's like, Hercules, go go get him, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's just like sending him off, and that'll be his yeah. own, his own sort of thingamajigger. Um, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> cool. Um, I think I think that's all all I got too. I, I this entire episode, I've held a pen and an index card, and I didn't write anything down that. <laughs> I would want to follow up with. So I assume, I assume we hit it all. So it's, <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess that does it. Take care, everyone. <laughs> See you Bye. next time. I'm going to go comfort my sick wife. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>